All right. Hello, Helsinki. Hello, guys. Very nice uh, to meet you all. Um, you have a uh, European one that you want to start with, so maybe we start with that one, and then we can take care of you. Yeah. Um, it's so fascinating to you know, sort of be here um, in that uh, first time in Europe for an extended period of time. And my immediate impression from sort of Helsinki and Slush is that everything here just feels like it's just somewhat off and somewhat confused and disconnected, you know, sort of from reality across a multitude of, you know, sort of dimensions. The first is, you know, sort of why does the biggest, you know, sort of European startup conference, which we can talk about whether or not the, you know, sort of term European startup has any, you know, sort of meaning, whether or not you are actually a European startup, um, chooses to, you know, sort of place itself in the, you know, sort of dead of winter in the North Pole. Uh, maybe that represents the, you know, sort of, you know, sort of shame and repression that Europe has. And if things were actually, you know, sort of going much better on the continent, this conference would be in July and Mekin and we would actually you know, sort of be partying, but instead we must you know, sort of sit here in the darkness. And then you know, beyond just the conference, the confusion extends you know, both to the entire city and then throughout the continent. In the city, you know, sort of last night I arrived in Helsinki, uh, you know, sort of plane lands, we're stuck on the tarmac for over three hours uh, because uh, the Helsinki airport somehow did not recognize that there is both uh, snow and wind in November in the North Pole. Um, and so they're somehow you know, sort of confused at a fundamental infrastructure level. And then you know, the, you know, sort of more macro-continental level, you think about, you know, sort of why are Finland, Sweden, and Norway, these sort of Nordic countries, somehow succumbing back into the, you know, sort of depths of socialism, despite the fact that, in theory, they should have all this, you know, sort of scar tissue from the Soviet Union. And so even as a, you know, sort of Nordic, you know, sort of set of states are confused about, you know, sort of their place, you know, sort of in the world. And so my sort of like, you know, initial impression of Helsinki and slush is, wow, everybody here just seems, you know, sort of deeply, deeply confused. Um, and what better way uh, to, you know, be emblematic of that confusion uh, than your company, which in theory is a European startup, but 99% of your gross profit dollars uh, are based in the United States. And so your engineering office might be in Portugal, yes. but it could be on Mars, it could be on Jupiter, it could be in Africa, it could matter less. At the end of the day, uh, you make your money from Europe. And so maybe with that, Virgilio, why did you decide to build a company in Europe of all places? Thank you. Uh, so um, let me tell you a little bit about SWORD, uh, and, and then we can discuss a little bit about what... Uh, what what's really special about starting to build something in Europe, and then also um, the challenges that come from it, right? And also the contrarian advice. So in a simplistic way, what SWORD does is basically we build AI care agents to deliver uh, world-class care to everyone in the world, uh, high-quality care, right? And th that, that means that if you have physical pain, you can recover with our uh, AI care agents. If you have mental health issues, the same thing and other um, uh, conditions. And the reason why this is important is because just with physical pain, right now, just in the US, there are 50, 50, 50 million Americans that don't have access to the quality of care that they need, but they have pain every single day, right? And that means going through life in a stage of surviving and not thriving or living a full life. And what's paradoxical about that is that, as you know, we develop such crazy technologies in so many different uh, uh, endeavors of our existence. But when it comes to healthcare, we are pretty much doing the same thing in the last 50 years, which is for you to have one hour of care, you need one hour of this highly specialized, scarce human resource, which is the clinician, right? And actually, there's this amazing chart from The Economist that shows the penetration of technology in the last 20 years in an industry, and you see the penetration of technology in electronics and automotive, and it went like this, and costs went like that. In healthcare, there, there was also a penetration of technology that went like this, but actually, paradoxically, costs went also like this, right? And so, where in other industries we've been using technology to shift the role of the, the labor of the human to the machine and with that drive access and lower costs, when it comes to healthcare, we've been using technology in the last 20 years to make the clinician marginally more efficient but actually much more costly in the process, right? And so by using AI and developing AI systems that can do the work of the clinician, you basically drive access and uh, quality of care and reduce costs, which is really the type factor of what the future of the healthcare world should look like, right? And so that was the vision when I started my PhD 
in Europe. And uh, as you very well know, it was very challenging to access the funding needed 10 years ago to build this technology because it's not like you were born in the middle of Silicon Valley, you have an idea, you have a pitch deck and someone uh, gives you $1 million to start building. The, the way that I was able to go from the pitch deck to the technology was no one will give me money, so I had to uh, write a research grant uh, that got me 100,000 euros, and with that, I had to have a PhD uh, um, uh, done. And so my PhD was a means to an end to really get access to the funding needed uh, to, to develop the technology and get the clinical validation, and then I launched SWORD, and our first investment in our first year was 150,000 euros, right? Our second investment in our second year was 200,000 euros, followed by a third investment in the third year of um, 400,000 euros, right? Just for reference, in 2021, in two weeks, in November, we raised 300 million dollars, uh, right? And so we know what it's like to really um, born in the middle of a desert of funding and what happened was, the plan was always survive in Europe, get access to cash, get some money, get the clinical validation done, develop the technology, prove the value, and then raise the Series A in Europe with the European investors, get that commercial traction, and then go to the Silicon Valley investors, the tier one Silicon Valley investors, that would allow us to get to access to the funding and also the credibility, um, and that's where, that was the end goal. Right? So I went, cool, let's start the Series A process. And I had like 50 meetings, 50 meetings in Europe where- Why do you think the European you know, sort of Series A process just like didn't work? Like what do you feel like you know, sort of people missed about you know, sort of SWORD? Because like obviously you've, you've turned into a massive company now, you're one of the continent's best successes, and yet somehow all of the continent's you know, sort of capital was you know, deeply disinterested in anything beyond a couple- I think know, sort it of comes to down you. to the meritocratic culture of the of Silicon Valley. And what I mean by that is that, like, I was a guy from Portugal with a PhD from a university in Portugal, right? I was not from London, from Germany. Uh, I was not part of Rocket Internet. I was not part of one of those companies that was like, oh, if this guy was on that company, uh, or from that university, then that guy must be good. There were, there, therefore, so you see, it's like credentialism, basically. It's like a credentialism thing. Credentialism it's like, it's like, focus. who the fuck is this guy, yeah, yeah. right? And why the fuck? The, and so the first conversations were like, oh, show me the revenue traction. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's the goal of this round is to yeah. get revenue traction, right? And so I had 50 meetings. And by the way, as you know, it's not just 50 meetings. It's yeah. not going up the past the first up. meeting, right? We were like, first meeting, that's cool. We we are not. Uh, uh, moving forward. And, uh, and then after six months, getting nowhere in Europe without money in the bank, I'm like, at 11 p.m. one night, uh, without knowing everyone in the US, I followed you on Twitter and I'm like, look, these guys, Dillian and Kozla Ventures, they are contrarian. They are really all about the technology and the science. So if there's anyone that's going to reply to a cold email from a random guy in Portugal, it's, well, it's either these or not. <laughs> <laughs> but probably 99% of chances, um, uh, I will get no reply. Which, by the way, will ex I will be exactly in the same situation as I was before. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. again, the, the, uh, uh, the cost opportunity was very high in that regard. Well, it's interesting because like, the classic advice is always like, reach out to the general partner, the most senior person at the firm, make sure you get a you know, sort of very warm connection. You actually effectively did the opposite. At the time, I was like the junior most person at Coast Ventures. You did a you know, sort of pure cold email. And so when you talk to, let's say, you know, sort of seed stage founders today, how do you like, describe that and say, look, like, you know, sometimes there are exceptions to the like, consensus rules of fundraising. It's like, don't be boxed by dogma. Yeah. In terms of, till that moment in time, everyone told me, like, don't spend time with junior VCs. They cannot drive the deal forward. Just talk to partners, right? And also, don't cold email anyone. Get a warm introduction. No one's going to reply to your cold email. Now, I knew no one that could introduce me to Silicon Valley folks. And I was certain that if someone would reply a cold email, it would definitely not be a partner that gets like 100 different Wouldn't emails. Wouldn't be even Ode who gets 1,000 right. emails a day. Like. Exactly. And so, like, it's honestly, 
out of desperation and realization that I have no other way of doing this. And so I sent one email uh, to Dillian, uh, a very well crafted email, I, 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 would, I should say, and then you reply like after one hour saying, I'm very interested in this, uh, let's schedule a call, and we schedule a call for the next day. And I actually vividly remember that you scheduled the call for like 2 a.m. my time, right? <laughs> and I'm not sure if you did that, uh, did that on purpose. A bit of a shit test. Like to, to test like, is this guy really committed or not? But like my immediate reply after one minute is, yeah, sure, I did the call at 2 a.m. Like, like, obviously, so, right? So I was trying to not fall asleep till 2 a.m. <laughs> to do the call, you call me. And like, that was the first time, by then I had like 50 meetings, that was the first time that like, someone read our clinical papers and wanted to discuss the clinical stuff and the technology behind it. Right? So that was like, very refreshing. Right? And, uh, and then after two days, you come back and tell me, look, I want to schedule a call with also with Vinod. And for us, Vinod was like this goat, godlike figure, like, are we meeting Vinod? Cool. Um, so we meet with Vinod, we were super nervous. We have like this pitch deck, very well prepared. And like first slide, Vinod says, yeah, I don't care if any of that. Like, and he starts like asking questions back to back to back to back. And it was like, ah, okay, let's go at it. <laughs> and, uh, and then at the end, you come back and say, look, we want to invest at this valuation. And probably you could say like one fifth of that valuation you will have accepted either way, <laughs> right? Because it's not like we were picky. Um, and, then, and then like you visit us in Portugal, and then we fly to Silicon Valley, and probably you can tell a little bit about that story from your point of view. And then like in four weeks from first call to term sheet sign, uh, we got our Series A led by Cause of Ventures, which was one of our, uh, which, was, which is a tier one investor in, in the Valley. So it was really contrarian, the full process end to end, and look, in the end, we did it that way, not because we were smart and we thought, oh, this doesn't make sense, we're going to do it this way from a first principles approach. It was really because we were desperate and we had to like, do it the only way we could do it, which was code email and go after the junior partner to grab his attention to look at this. Totally, and I always tell the junior investors, you have to like, look and do you know, things that other people aren't willing to do, right? You know, sort of flew to Portugal on a dime to actually go you know, sort of meet the you know, sort of founder in person, not something that a general partner is able to do. They have a booked out schedule for three months, they've got family, et cetera, but when you're you know, sort of 24, you gotta get on that plane and uh, you know, sort of take the uh, red eye. Um, let's talk you know, a little bit about you know, sort of building on the European continent. Obviously, you know, sort of when we met, 80% of your profit dollars were actually you know, sort of based in Europe and Australia. Uh, now, obviously, you know, so now, you know, so five and a half years later, uh, companies, you know, uh, maybe a thousand x in size, and obviously, ninety nine percent of your profit dollars are, you know, sort of based in the United States. Talk about what it means to, like, you know, build a company in Europe, but also recognize that the United States is the biggest, you know, sort of capital market and ultimately biggest, you know, sort of market for your clients. So yeah, so <coughs> so is, we are a U.S. company. We we are roughly nine hundred folks. Uh, more than than six hundred are in the U.S. Um, we just happened to... But you're in Portugal. We, I'm in Portugal as a CEO. And by the way, the reason why I'm, I, I like to be in Portugal is... It's and you love in-person work. Like, you have an office. I love in-person work. And so talk about that. Like, the CEO is not where the, like, you know, sort of majority of... Like, I, you know, sort so of I do is. that, honestly, from a selfish <coughs> reason, because I'm a deeply rooted <laughs> family guy, so I want my kids to grow up next to my parents, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not like, oh, I do this... Even if they turn out to be Marxists. Well, they won't. <laughs> uh, actually, that, that would be an interesting turn of events. Uh, <laughs> But the, the reason also why it's important is because you are building outside of the bubble, right? And I think it's very, very important for, like, there are amazing things in the U.S., and I'm a big fan of, of like, the acceptance of risk, the audacity, the meritocracy. Uh, but it's also, especially Silicon Valley, it's also an eco chamber, eco chamber, right? Where you have, and that's why, one example of the importance of being outside of that echo chamber, outside of that bubble. In 2021, look, we raised our Series B, our Series C, and our Series D in one single year, right? We got like flushed with cash. We didn't start hiring like crazy, right? And so I saw all the other companies like doubling the headcount, hiring like crazy, and then when the market turned, like doing massive layoffs. We never did a layoff, you know, and so, we really like to have the combination of like the best of Europe. And what do you think is the best of Europe? Like talk about, what do you feel like you pull from I the I think continent? my view on Europe <clears> is <throat> we have really, really good talent in all disciplines. Engineering, product, design, 
clinical operations. We don't know how to sell ourselves like the, the guys in the US do. Yep. So marketing and sales, we have that in the US. But in terms of building stuff, we are really, really good builders. Right? What I think we are missing here in Europe, and I think, honestly, uh, I think that's what we do well, is really about managing this talent. Right? Exponentiating the quality and the output of this talent. And so when you are able to combine that US-like management of like, not go for a 10, go for a 12, don't go for a 7, get the 12, and that like, move fast, and, and really driving your team forward, and you combine that, which is a US-like, uh, a, a quite US thing, and you combine that with the really good talent that you have in Europe, and you are able to drive that talent, it's really a powerful combination. And basically, in a, in a nutshell, that's the story of Soul. I want to talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, I think um, you guys, you know, sort of approach the healthcare, you know, sort of market in a way where you focus on the, you know, sort of clinical outcome and the patients, and then layered on more and more, you know, sort of technology over time. Whereas I think, you know, sort of today, there may be a variety of people in the audience that are, you know, sort of succumbing to the, you know, sort of, you know, thinking, you know, sort of bubble, the consensus view of AI is really hot, let me go build something around AI and start with the tool rather than start with the, you know, sort of end, you know, sort of use case. And you guys also built up a phenomenal distribution engine, right? Like you have, you know, sort of huge, you know, sort of client base where now you can use AI as a tool to enable your business rather than being a, like, AI healthcare company, you know, sort of from the, uh, you know, sort of from the get-go, which at least at Founders Fund, our thesis has been, um, you know, the best and most interesting AI companies are very rarely going to be a quote-unquote AI company. Yeah. It's going to be a company that, you know, sort of builds out a phenomenal distribution engine and then happens to you know, sort of layer on AI. And so talk about how you've watched, I'm sure, a variety of companies come into the space being like, the, like we're the AI healthcare company yeah. and you're like, what the fuck, I've you know, got 10,000 patients and you know, we're layering on same AI now, uh, but you know, we've, we've distributed AI way more than anyone else. Yes, so uh, in terms of numbers, we delivered 5 million AI sessions and, uh, and 50 million minutes of AI care. So we are really, actually we are the company I think that is doing this most at scale. Uh, what's special, to your point, what's special in, term, in that regard on source, like we bring that AI Silicon Valley product and innovation magic, but we also deeply understand healthcare, right? And deeply and, and understanding healthcare is really understanding the incentives that define healthcare and the behavior of healthcare. So I see lots of, of founders building these AI health companies where AI is doing all the job without a clinician in the loop. Right? And they say, I don't need a clinician in the loop from a product perspective. My AI is good, is independent from the clinician. I can do everything just with the AI. And even if it's that too, the market will never accept, right? Because the market is risk averse. So by saying that you have the clinician in the loop, even if it's not necessary, it's very important from a perception perspective from clients saying, okay, this is not that risky. There's always a clinician in the loop. I will accept that. And, and the problem with founders sometimes is that they are very utopian and idealistic on how things in healthcare should be. They fail to realize that there are behaviors, intrinsic behaviors in healthcare, and also incentives that define the way things are done. And if you go at it in an idealistic way, you will lose because you will never get to market traction. And so the change, to your point, is much more incremental in terms of you get there, you prove your value, you gain credibility, and then you can do more on the AI innovation front. Right? But you don't start like this atomic bomb, like AI does everything, I don't need humans, this is the best thing that you should have, just buy me. Okay, so imagine you know, somebody out in the audience is like uh, the you know, sort of 10 year younger you know, sort of version of you. Do you tell them that they can actually you know, sort of build something like SOAR today in you know, sort of Europe? Has it fallen too much to you know, sort of socialism at this point and they should just pack up their bag and figure out how, how to get a visa to the United States and actually build something big there? What do you think the future of, the, you know, sort of building on the continent looks like? Look, I think there are many examples of, of, of folks like me, like one, one of our investors is Daniel Ek, the CEO of Spotify. He's based in, in Stockholm right now. Yep. Right? So there's lots of, of, of founders and CEOs of global companies that are based in Europe. And Look, in the end, you can build a great company from Europe, but I think the, the secret is to look from the get-go at the global market as your market, yep. right? If I was still focused on the European market as my target market, 
uh, we will be dead by now. We have dozens of Fortune 500 companies as clients, dozens of Fortune 50 companies as clients, biggest health plans in the US as clients. 2024, the National Health Service in Portugal is still asking us to do a pilot, right? Like, I think that's like, that, that's the simple story that showcases the risk aversion where when a fucking company that is well, one of the most well-known startups, well, the most well-known startup in the country, really successful in the US with the really biggest companies in the world. And then you have these like <laughs> bureaucrats in the National Health Service saying, yeah, sure, but maybe we should do a pilot, right? And we are like, yeah, well, whatever, right? Like we have such a big pull from the US that we don't care about it. Luckily, we are blessed that it doesn't matter. But it's just crazy, the risk aversion that the European has in terms of accepting solutions. So I think like starting building your solution, building a deep tech solution, really something that's really complex. You do that in Europe because you have amazing talent, if you are able to drive that talent. But then like, when you come time to get to the market, think global, and I think that's key. So you obviously have a you know, sort of team all over the world, which you know, I think by default, most people think, I'm just gonna build this thing you know, sort of fully remotely distributed, no office, et cetera. You've taken a pretty opposite approach. You have like, you know, explicit offices in a variety of cities, but if people are expected to go in, you do these you know, sort of in-person offsites with your entire team you know, sort of once a year. Talk about how you sort of bucked against the trend of, you know, sort of the you know, sort of COVID era, you know, sort of Zoom, you know, sort of relaxed, you know, sort of fake jobs, uh, and instead you know, sort of leaned hard into gathering your team on a regular basis in person. Why did you decide to do that? What do you think it's had in terms of impact on your culture? So I think you need to be pragmatic. Like, I would love to have everyone in the portal office, like the 900 folks in the portal office, right? Of course, being a global company, that's not reasonable, right? So we have offices in Porto, in Lisbon, in New York, in Salt Lake City, in Chicago, and we are expanding to other offices, right? I do still believe that talent is king. So if I have the best guy in San Francisco, even if I don't have an office in San Francisco, I'm going to hire the best guy, right? But I really think that in-person exposure is very, very, very important, right? But I also know that I prefer to have an A in San Francisco than a B in New York, even if it's in person, right? So that's how I, I look at that. And honestly, then, when we have a proper company operating system that is really able to measure what people are doing and the output, then I think it's not that important to be in person. But in terms, especially in the early stages, we wouldn't be able to build the company that we are and solve the technical problems if everyone was not in person. And that, that I deeply believe. Now at our scale as a global company, it's not even feasible. But on those early days where you are facing that tech a problem that if you don't fix it, you don't get to market. And it, uh, it implies that everyone is like spending the night going back and forth and arguing and discussing and shouting to fix that problem. That's where innovation comes from. And we've seen that. Maybe one of the other things you've done that's you know, sort of relatively contrarian is you guys recently you know, sort of tweeted about the fact that you had your first free cash flow, you know, sort of positive quarter. For you know, sort of a pre-IPO company, you know, sort of the consensus advice has always been, if you're free cash flow positive, it means you're, you know, can't figure out, you know, sort of where to be, you know, sort of investing your investor's capital for the highest ROI. Why did you guys decide to have such a, you know, sort of focus on efficiency when, especially in 2021, obviously the, you know, insane focus was on gather as much capital and spend it as quickly as possible. But even today, that's sort of like the default, you know, sort of, you know, uh, in investor pushes, people want you to be, you know, sort of spending as much as possible. Why did you guys decide to actually like focus on, effi on efficiency, unlike almost everybody else in the market? So this is actually something that I learned from Cosla Ventures. And I think it's Keith that has this amazing uh, analogy, which is like a company is like cement, right? When you are starting in the early days, it's moldable, you can change it. If you try to change it later on, you only need to break it apart. So the problem is that I see with companies, like they are very, very wasteful. And then like, oh, we, we, can, we need to converge those profitability. Let's be efficient, right? And then like, it's a shit show of change internally because it's a company that is not used to be uh, efficient, right? We are, since again, since our, because of our funding story, we always been efficient from the day we started, right? And so that, and we are showcasing that it's not one or the other. You don't need, you can converge those profitability and still grow very, very fast. What you need is to be creative and to be smart in terms of how to do things, right? So as an example, we don't hire agencies, we do everything internally, right? Our boots are then internally by our team. Right? We, everything that we build, we build internally and we have that acquired knowledge. 
how we launch new plays, we develop them in a startup-like fashion, which is we hire a GM, we give them an idea, and we give that person $1 million. And that person has 12 months to get to product market fit. And if they don't, we cut the funding. If they get to product market fit, you get another $5 million, and that's your Series A. And they are doing that in a self-sufficient way. So I think the, there is this uh, contrarian advice that's like, if you need to invest to grow and waste money to grow, and I think you can do both at the same time. And our growth showcases that. We are doubling each year and conversion to profitability at the same time while expanding to other markets. But it's harder because you, do it, you need to do it in a smart way, which is be creative and be smart. Well, V, um, companies obviously you know, are doing great, changing the American healthcare system. Hopefully one day Portugal decides to give you a pilot. Maybe it'll be after your guys' IPO, they'll finally think you guys are a big yeah. enough company. Maybe take they a risk me, on. Maybe they give me a pilot for my private jet. Exactly, okay. a pilot for the private jet sounds nicer. You. Would you, now that you are a partner at Founders Fund, no longer a junior VC, if an European founder sends you the same cold email that I did six years ago, would you reply? I'd or reply not? and I'd probably send my associate to get on the plane since I don't like getting on the plane myself anymore now that I have a kid. And I'd be very careful with doing much more of a shit test on socialism versus not. I've uh, made the accident of not testing on that and accidentally investing into a socialist European founder. Well, Turns it out it doesn't work out if you're trying to be a venture capitalist. Well, it did work out okay for you to invest in some European companies. So. It's true, it's true. So, so founders in the audience, email Dillian, he will reply. <laughs> Thank Sweet. you. Thank you, everyone.